Hi, I'm Father Joseph Mary, and welcome back to A Simple Word. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we're going to hear a shorter version of Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. We'll get the full version on Christmas Day. So today, I'd like to focus on the full version we'll hear on Christmas. Matthew begins his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Seems like a strange way to begin a book, doesn't it? If you were to write a novel today and started your book anything like this, don't even bother sending it to a publisher. It's a snoozer. But for the Jews, genealogies were really important. In fact, the temple had an archive of ancestry that was meticulously documented. There were practical and legal reasons for these genealogies. Proof of inheritance or rights, kingship, etc. They were used to settle disputes over land and over property. But if we look a bit closer at the genealogy of Jesus, we find some startling names on the list. Let's just begin with David and Bathsheba, the great king of Israel, the golden boy who slew Goliath and united the 12 tribes of Israel. He was the same David who had entered into a sinful relationship with Bathsheba, after which she had had her husband Uriah murdered. Rahab was a harlot. Ruth was a pagan Gentile. Tamar was an adulteress. The list goes on and on. If Matthew had ransacked the pages of the Old Testament for improbable candidates, he couldn't have discovered a more incredible list of ancestors for Jesus Christ. Then we come to the Gospel. Things don't seem to get much better there. An unmarried woman, an unplanned pregnancy, an implausible explanation. It's not hard to imagine what the neighbors were saying and thinking. They aren't even married yet. Who's the father? She and her love child should be stoned. And then there's the torment going on in Joseph's heart. How could this have happened? This didn't seem like the Mary he knew at all. Was the angel in his dream more than just a dream? The call for a census that forced Joseph and Mary to depart for Bethlehem? It might have been a welcome respite from the shaming eyes and the pointing fingers. But things don't get any better there either. Along the way, the time comes for Mary to give birth. But they haven't found any lodgings for the night. But the city is crammed with people who have arrived for the census. Any spare room had long been occupied. Little ramshackle huts have been built in between the houses as hasty shelters to rent out to pilgrims. But they're already bursting at the seams. There's no welcome faces or open doors. And so Joseph and Mary greet their newborn son amid the filth of a frigid cave surrounded by livestock and animal droppings. But again, things don't get a whole lot better. Not long after the initial joy of Jesus' birth, King Herod, obsessed with his power, unleashes bloodthirsty soldiers to slaughter every male child in Bethlehem. Joseph, Mary, and their infant son are forced to flee for their lives. Jesus is going to grow up in a strange land far from home, surrounded by strange people and strange customs. What kind of a plan was this? This is God we're talking about. This is the great plan of the Almighty to enter into human history. This is the ingenious plot devised by eternal wisdom to enter into the fullness of time. It doesn't sound so great. He comes from a lineage of pagans, idolaters, adulterers, and sinners. He enters into a situation which brings about shame, embarrassment, gossip, and finger pointing. He comes to a town where his mother's desperately pregnant and where the people slam the door in his face. His coming is met with the brutal slaughter of countless innocents and the torment of grieving parents. I'm sorry, this is not a good plan. This is God we're talking about. And this is a broken plan. It's a horrible plan. And that's exactly the point. St. Athanasius wrote so long ago, God became man 
that man might become God. But in order to do that, God has to enter into our mess. He has to enter into our brokenness and our suffering and our failure and our pain and our desperate cries for someone to save us. And that's exactly what he did. And what a marvelous miracle it is. Because God was at work through it all. Through all the sins and the failures of the genealogy of Jesus, God was at work. Through the pain, through the embarrassment and the unspoken accusations at Nazareth, God was at work. In Mary's fear and in Joseph's doubt, God was at work. In the slammed doors of Bethlehem and in the cold cave of his crib, God was at work. He was at work through Herod's rage, through the broken hearts of parents clinging to their slaughtered sons. God was at work through the fearful flight by night to a strange land. God was at work in all the mess and sin of human failure. And this is the incredible, beautiful message of Christmas. Because it's a message of hope. Because as we look around the world today, it's a mess. Whether it's threats of nuclear war, whether it's terrorists running around and blowing up anything and everything. We have church shootings and school shootings and mall shootings. It's a frightening, devastating mess. And in here too, in our own hearts, it can be a devastating mess. Like Joseph and Mary, we have our fears and our doubts. We have pain and we have suffering. We have broken families and broken communities. We have sin and grief and guilt and fear that we stuff deep down and don't talk about. We have things that kill us inside. And in the midst of this all, we have a cry from our heart, a silent scream of desperation for someone to save us. And that's exactly what God does. This is the message of Christmas. God doesn't change. And he's working right now in all of our mess and in all of our failure. Because no matter how broken we may feel, we're precious and priceless in the eyes of God. And that light, that light still shining in the darkness, and the darkness can never overcome it. I'm Father Joseph Mary, and on behalf of the Capuchins, Merry Christmas to you and your family. If you found this reflection helpful, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe.